Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to continue our project on this one. So we have uh, finalized the homepage in the previous video. If you haven't seen my previous video, please go back to see the project in session one, where you will see how to build this beautiful homepage. In today's session, we're going to continue this homepage um, by adding a few more features. Uh, we're going to activate this site menu click function. So whenever you click on a button on the set menu, ideally the styling for the button should be different from the rest. And also we're going to trigger the activate section. So the activated section should pop in and pop out, disappear and appear. All of those things, we're going to arrange those first. So once we've done that, we're going to build the individual section one by one. So going back to your code editor, I need you to open up these two components. One is your side menu because we're going to handle the side menu activation and also your main component as well. Because primarily, all of those sections will eventually be loading over here. So in the side menu, what we're going to do here is to build a function that will allow you to click on. And once you click on, the activation or the active status should change accordingly. So basically, we're going to write a function right above here. We already created the uh, state variable and a state function for the navigation. So we're still going to use it. We have never ever used this set name data before. So this is how we're going to use it in a function. Const handle nav on click. This is normally how I give the name of the function. It's like a naming convention. So if you want to uh, do something in the parent component, you just say that handle something. And that equals to, think about based on what we're going to trigger or activate the navigation button. If you're going back to our nav list data, you will see there's an active property for each one of those object. So we're going to have to identify which one is true, which one is false. The one that is true is going to have a different styling. The one that is false will not show that different styling, right? So this is our thing to look at. And also, to identify which one is supposed to be true or false, we use the ID because each object in the, date, in the nav list data have a different ID. And going back to here, we're just going to say we use the ID to identify the different one. And that's the error function, equal error. And then what we're going to do here is that when we click on this thing, we're going to map through the existing list of the navigation, and we're going to set all the states to false, and we're going to identify the one that we just click and set specifically that one to true. So this is the logic behind. And so over here, we say const new nav data. That one equals to it's going to be a nav function. We're using the local states variable nav data, and we're going to, we're going to do a mapping. So inside the map, we say nav arrow function at nav dot active. We set all every single one of them to false. Why do we do that? Because initially, the first item has been default has been set to true by default, right? So we have to set everyone to false, and then we identify which one has been clicked and set that one to true. So going back, once we set everything to false, we'll just say that if nav dot underscore id equals to the ID, this one gets passed in, it's the one actually we click on. If the navigation ID in the list in our data array actually matches the one that we clicked, basically means we have found the one that we clicked. We set that one's active status specifically to true. So in terms of the if function, if you only have one line of code after it, you don't have to write the brackets, the curly braces. So if you have multiple lines, you need to wrap them with the curly braces. Just, just the uh, JavaScript uh, syntax. And then after line that, we just return that nav that we have set to true. So here, we generate the new nav data, which will replace the old one with the new active status. So once we've done that, we just set our nav data to the new data we created above. OK, so this is how we write a function. And if you are a fluent writer of the JavaScript, these two lines can be combined into one line. For education and demonstration purpose, I like to write it in two lines for you to comprehend in an easy way. And or alternatively, you can just put the remaining part, this bit, directly into the brackets without assigning it to a new variable. That'll save you one line, okay? And down here, we have the navigation list item. This is where we're gonna click on things, right? So we're gonna write the on click function over here. We give that a component a property which name is nav on click. So this is also the naming convention. So when we actually handle that event, we say the function name handle something. 
when we give the name to the property, we do not add the world handle. So that one will equals to the handle function. Handle nav on click. Okay, we save that. Because we create a new property for that child component nav list item, we have to go to the nav list item and pass in that property, which is the one we just created. So I just double click and copy that, pass it in over here. So this one moves in. And on here, we have to write the on click, the actual on click events for our anchor tag. So on click, that one will equal to the property that we passed in. However, we're not going to write it straight away in this way. We have to do an arrow function to trigger that one. An arrow function, a bracket. We have to pass in the ID variable because this function, if you look at it, consumes a taking variable. If we do not have that parameter, the function wouldn't know which one you click. So we're going to pass in the ID. How do we get the ID of the item? Because we, in the previous property, we have also passed in the entire item. The entire item is each individual game item. If you look at our game data, you will see that each game item has the ID. So we can access that using item.id straight away. So here we just pass in item.id. This name is exactly the same as your JSON data. It has, it has to be the exact same. Otherwise, it won't work. So once you pad in, this function has been triggered. This function comes from here, and this function comes from here. And this function is the handle name on click function over here. So now you are able to handle the click events of the nav list item. So again, the principle in the child component, which is the nav list item, we read that event of clicking. And in the parents component, which is the side menu, we handle that event of clicking, right? So going back to the browser to see if it works. But before we do so, we're just going to do a simple test. Uh, let's console.log that ID. So once we click on the individual uh, nav list item, it should pop up the ID in our console. So going back, just turn on our console. Because that, just move to console. So we click that one. Yeah, that shows one there in the console. I click the categories, that shows two. And my libraries, it shows three. It works all OK. But how come this status is not changing? The styling is still the same. Because remember, in our CSS in the previous session, we have set the nav list item, um, the different styling. If we're going back to the site menu, and over here, you will see that we have set this one on hover, it should have that uh, box standing, uh, box shadow effects. And on active, it should have that as well. Of course, it wouldn't be able to show because we haven't set the active class name. And going back to the nav list item, we need to set the class name to this part for this CSS to work because it works on the A, okay, the anchor tag. So let's do that. Over here, we're just going to do a conditional class name. Mm, class name. Curly braces, back tick, basically means that we are going to do a temporary literal. And inside it, we write the money sign double curly braces. We're going to ask um, if the item is active, because the, the, uh, each item uh, has a uh, active status in the navigation. If it's active, we're going to say we put on the active name in the class name. Otherwise, we'll be make it undefined. So if we write this, we're actually going to use the active which is this one, true or false, we're going to put it on over here. So that's how we access that. So whenever you click this function, we're going to trigger the active status for the one you click. And this one will become true. When this one become true, the active name for the class name will be shown. And once that's shown in the CSS, you will see the box shadow effect should be turned on. So this is our logic behind it. So once we've done that, we're going back to the browser, just going to reload the page. And you can see the home button has been set to active by default because you can see the box shadow surrounding it, right? So this is not just a hovering effect. If you click it, this one will be changed to that box shadow one as well. This one changes, this one changes. Going back to home, that one changes as well. So everything's working all fine. This is how we do the navigation active status change in React.js. So now we have done that. Job is not finished yet because what, what I want to do is that whenever you click the button, the section page should change as well. Not just the button active status, 
but the section page status as well. So, so far, we have only built one section page, which is the home one. I'm just going to build a few blank section page uh, for each one of those titles, the categories, my libraries, and also my back uh, in React.js for now. Going back to our page folder, this is where we're going to build all the blank sections. So the second one I'm going to build is the category. Categories, JSX, enter RFCE to create a boilerplate. These are temporarily not very useful. We'll just close that out. Um, a very good habit is to create a CSS file right after you create a component. And because later on, you're going to do the individual styling anyway, just in case you forget. Categories.css. So that one's there. You must link the CSS back to your component page by importing it. So we say that uh, in the same folder, categories.css. That's how you put it in. So these two are linked together, the categories and the categories.css. That's done. And over here, we're not going to use the div for the category because we do have a formal way to write sections. So we delete that. What I'm going to say is um, we're going to create a section with the ID name of categories. Tab. So once we have that, I also like to give a class name of the same name, categories. And inside here, we're not going to build anything so far, so I'm just going to write a H1 title uh, saying this is the category. So that we have a blank section there. So once we have the black section there, we can use this section in our main page because down below, the home section is supposed to be the category section, also my library section, and also other section as well. So let's just uh, uh, do a bit of hard working and build all of those sections um, at one time. That'll make our labor work a lot easier. So the next one I'm going to build is the library. So we're just going to say my library. My library, enter, create a boilerplate. And you probably want to do the CSS as well if you want to do some styling. So that one is done. And uh, just like a very conventional work, import that. Same folder. So that one is done. So once we've done that, we close off the CSS one, and we're just going to write those uh, section starting code over here as well. Um, this code is not the super, super clean code. Uh, if we build a super clean code, it will be very, very hard to illustrate in the course for education purpose, because that will be too many sub um, component and child component wrapping on each other, and you are not able to comprehend that easy. So I have a, um, basically built the big structure but for the teeny tiny part, I just leave it all on one page for you to comprehend it in an easy way. So in the my library, I would say that uh, we build a, a section. So we wrap it in a bracket. And inside, I will say section, I give the ID, library, looks like my code is not working. Yeah, that one works. All good. So, and also I'm going to give the class name of the same name. So once that then we're just going to create a title for this section for now. Yep. So we have that section now. That's all good. So the category section is done. My library section is done. What is the last one? My back. Okay, we're going to create a back section as well. So over here, we'll just create a back uh, and then .jsx. So create a boilerplate and a new file called back.css. We're just going to import that CSS file. And then over here, we also, as usual, create a section, give a section name back, id back. and I'm just going to create a same class name. And inside here, we're just going to give a h1 title, my bag. So all structure has been set up, OK? And this will make our 
future work much, much easier because whenever you want to use the section, you have that component page built already. This won't break your logic, won't break your source. You could just continue your coding. And close this off, including the category. So now I'm going to illustrate how we're going to turn on and turn off that section active status in our um, main page. So the idea is that if you look at our navlist data page, it has a target. This target I set is specifically to target a section name. So if you have a section whose name is library or ID is a library, we're going to target that section. So whenever we click on the navigation um, of the same name, it's going to find the target of that section name. This is the logic, how we link the navigation to a specific section. We're going to use that over here. But to locate a section position on our DOM, we have to use some kind of a reference, right? Whenever we click on this one, how do we refer to that page? In our uh, uh, vanilla JavaScript, we have the DOM selector. We can select the documents uh, by ID, select the element by class name, or uh, select an element by query, all of those things to select the DOM element. Uh, can we do the same sort of thing in React.js? And the answer is yes, we can do so. If you want to select a DOM element and make a target on it, you're going to have to use something called a use reference hook which is another built-in hook in React.js and very, very handy. I'll show you how to use it. So here, we're going to create a few references. Use reference hook. That's uh, use ref is for use reference hook. So once we've done that, we're just going to, in this page, in the main, generate a few reference to represent each section. So the way to use use reference hook is very easy. You just need to give that reference a name. This name is purely up to you. If you want to refer to the home section, I just say that the home ref, that one equals two. You call that use reference hook function and put in nothing basically means initially it's nothing. It's a null, okay? It's, uh, its value has been set to null by default. And the second one to say, if you want to refer to the second section, I'll just say that use category. Use categories ref. Make sure there's no spelling mistakes. 99% of the mistake made uh, in the coding process is typo. And uh, the remaining one is you forgot to import something. So it's not like a, a crucial or vital error that you make that's going to kill your program now. It's just you double check if there's any typos or anything you missed out. So we, we create our second reference, the category reference. And the third one is going to be the library ref. The same logic, use reference. And the last one is the back reference for the back section. Back ref. So that's going to be use reference. So we have our four reference being created, right? And now, because we want to refer to that section by adding on this reference, what I'm going to do is that we have to put this reference and to our section name. Otherwise, you just created those empty reference. Uh, how the computer would know which one is linked to? How the computer would know this one is linked to the home section, this one is going to be linked to the category section. We have to tell the computer which one it belongs to, right? So down here, say for example in the home section, what we're going to do is going to, we're going to create another property called a reference. This is named by you. It's not a built-in property. That one we're going to link this home ref that we just created to it. So we just say home ref over here. So now you pass that home reference as a property to the home component. So when we move to the home component over here, over here, we can import that reference. So now you have that reference which you created in the parent component main and you use that as a, a property and you import that property uh, by doing object destructuring. And now we're going to put it on the section ref. This ref, R-E-F, these three letters, these are built-in property. The, the reactor knows when you put this, you're going to do a referring. And that one going to equals to the one you created, okay? Which is the reference that we put in. That's why I named this one in full, just trying to, for you to defer the difference between these two. This is the built-in uh, actual reference name, uh, actual reference property name. This reference is what we generated on our own. So we link the reference that we created to the actual section. Okay, so now the computer knows whenever you say, hey, I want to see the home reference. Can you show me that? Yes, where's the home section? The one that has been put that name in, which is this one. 
the entire part of that section is named the home section. This is how we do a referring in React.js. Very, very useful skills. Later on, when you build a huge applications, you do need to refer to a different part of the component to do manipulations, and you will know how handy this will be. Okay, so let's finish the rest of the job. What I want to do here is that we're going to import our second uh, section, which is our category. Hopefully, that will pop up. Mm, no, category, let's. No, looks like uh, my importing is not working. Yeah, that one works. Yeah. Just double check the above home categories all from the same folder. That looks all fine to me. And save that. Uh, again, we're going to pass in the same set of things in the in the category. We're going to pass in the games because the category also needs the game. Same as the home. The game has been built in the previous session. If you don't know what it is, uh, just go back to my previous video to see how we map the data from the uh, RESTful API. And then the ref equals to the new reference that we created, which is the category ref. I'm just going to copy and paste in case I got any typos. And once we've done that, we're just going to go to the, the category section page that we created and take those two variables in. One is the game. The other one is the reference. And here we're going to consume that reference by saying the ref of this section equals to the reference you created. Okay. And now it looks like that. This one has been firmly and tightly linked to each other and by this reference hook. And the next one to it, we're going to import our uh, my library. It has the import. And we're going to set the same thing, games equals to the games data. And reference equals to, we created here, the library ref, right? The library ref. And in my library component, we're just going to take those two property. One is game, the other one is reference. And over here, we're just going to trigger that ref and link that to the ref we created. Okay, so now this one has been all linked up, all linked up, no problem. Save. Let's see if I have in, yeah, I have imported that to my library. Uh, section successfully. The last one is the back. Uh, looks like it doesn't have it. So let's just finish that for now. And then I delete one. The, the trick is that if it's uh, not showing that the automatic import, you just type the name in full and you delete the last letter, retype it. Normally it pops up with this import sign and it asking you, do you want to import? And you, you just press tab to import it. Yeah, just don't have to uh, type this import uh, on your own. games, ref, and then we're going to do is uh, we import that uh, back ref. The back ref has been generated over here. So all of those four references that we previously created has now been used as a property to our component, the section component. So if we go to our back, we're going to import those things, games here, and then we're going to have our reference. And down here in the section, we're going to create the, the real reference and link it to the reference that we created. Yep, so this all linked up. So we, once we've done the linking, the job comes up to a lot easier because we are now in, in the DOM page, we know how to refer to each individual section now. We know their name because we give them a reference, we know their name, and we can refer them, call them, and manage them. So how do we do so? Over here, right below, the reference hook, we're going to create a section array for us to manage them. This is going to contain all of our section data. And the first one is going to be, we give it a name property. I'm going to save it of time. I'm just going to copy and paste in, actually, because this is just a list of data. And I'll explain. So we'll create a section array, which have a name, which have the reference when it tells you which reference it belongs to, if the home section has the reference belong to the, the home ref, and if that section is active or not. If it's active, we show it to true, because on the DOM page, there will be only one section uh, shown to the user at a time. You do not want to show four sections altogether, right? If the home section is true, it's been activated, the remaining three sections should be hidden, right? That's why we use this active to say which one is active, so only one gets to show. 
So the home one has been set to active uh, to true by default. The other three is false. The same logic is whenever we click on the navigation button, the page should find the reference of that section by locating it right using that reference, and then set that section's active status to true, and then show that section. The remaining action sections will be hide. And this is how the logic works. So once we've done that, we are able to write another function called handle section active. So because we need to tell the computer which one is active, which one is not. And here we say handle section active. Soon you will find that um, the things you learned in React.js is so different from the vanilla JavaScript. That the entire way of thinking about things is different. So even though we all write JavaScript code, this is also JavaScript, but it, the logic of thinking about it is so different. And I would recommend everyone who uh, uh, have a certain level of knowledge of JavaScript gets to know React.js as soon as possible, because in the future, this is going to be the trend of development. There are still heaps of websites built so far with vanilla JavaScript. I wouldn't say that's not uh, good, uh, depending on the project size. Um, for small to medium-sized projects, it wouldn't make a huge big difference for you to develop using vanilla JavaScript or React.js. But if you want to go to the big company or you want to create a large scale of applications, uh, React.js is the way to go because this will make your code more maintainable and more reusable. The vanilla JavaScript, you pretty much it's very hard for you to reuse your code uh, unless some functions you can reuse it. But here, if you create some component, you can reuse that component even in your other project. You just copy and paste your code, right? So the way to, log, to write the handle section active function is that we need to know which one you are targeting at. So this one will take in the parameter called a target, and that's also going to be an arrow function. Inside it, we're going to do a bit of a section mapping. So the section mapping, because we just created that section array, which contains all the section each as a object, we're just going to map through that to identify which section has been targeted, and then we set that section to true. So sections.map. I love this higher order array functions. They are so handy to deal with the data. And it's very quick. It doesn't consume a lot of your uh, computer's energy. So section. This is going to map through each object inside that array, basically the four sections. And for each one, we're going to say section.ref. Let's say that uh, do a test for now to show you what's going on. Let's just console.log. Console.log and that uh, section dot ref. You have to say section dot ref because we have the reference property here. This will get you find that section reference, and then we say current. Current means it's current status. Okay, so we just uh, console.log dot that and. Oh, this is going to be brackets, not the uh, the curly brace. So we're just going to console the log for now. And we haven't got a place to use this one. Think about where to use this section activation function. Of course, it's on the navigation bar, right? Whenever we click on the uh, navigation, we want to uh, activate that section. So we're going to have to put this function into our side menu. So over here, in the side menu, we say we create a new property called section active and make that property linked to our handle section active function over here. Okay, so now it has been successfully linked, and we're gonna go to our side menu, not the CSS one, but this one. In our side menu, in our side menu, we're gonna add our property, which is the uh, section active. So that function has been passed in into this child component. And we're going to amend the previous handle nav on click function. <clears throat> because previously, we only deal with one thing. Whenever we click on it, <clears throat> it just basically just trigger the active status for that navigation button without touching the section activated. So now we're going to do one more thing. Whenever we click on it, we're also going to set that section to active true or false. How do we do that? We're adding in a new parameters. So we delete that ID, brackets ID, we add in that target. This target comes in by natural, because remember in our nav list data, we have the target of the section, which matches the exact same name of the actual section ID name, or the class name, right, the same. 
So now we're going to use that as our second parameter and to trigger that activation. So down here, not only we want to set our navigation status to active or non-active, but also we're going to set our section. So we call that function section active, and then we pass in that target. So now our section has the parameter of the target. And you go back to the main, you will see that this handle section active going to take that target variable and console.log that section on our console, right? This is how we're going to do it. And one more thing I missed out is that when we click on here previously, um, it's going to have that function passed in. But now we have to do a slight amendment to our super child component, which is the navigation list item, because at the moment, this one here, it only pass in the ID. Because we change the function, it takes actually two parameters now. We have to pass in the target as well. Very easy. We just beside it say item dot target. Because the nav list item itself has the ID property, also have the target property. You look at it. Previously we used the ID to identify which one has been clicked. And now we're just gonna incur this target property to tell the computer which target of the section is looking at. Okay? So now it takes two parameters for this function and save it. This function is this function, handle nav one click, which is this one. And this one have done two jobs. One job is to activate our navigation button. The other one is to target the active section, right? And then this one linked back to the previous parents component in our main, and that's how we trigger it. So ideally, this thing has been linked up so far all correct. Let's just go back to the console to see if it works. Yeah, back to the browser, opened up your console. So let me just click on the home. As you can see, all of those uh, sections has been the console.log on our console. So now you can understand, I make this slightly larger. Now you can understand what this uh, code mean. There's a section.ref.current will refer exactly to that entire section. Uh, it will give you the part of your code for that section. And if you click on it, that section is there. It has been passed out of your code and put it on the console. Really, really great, right? This is one of the fantastic things to find any element on your DOM using that user reference hook. You must use it very wisely and smartly. Do not use it everywhere uh, because the majority of the job can be done by use state hook. It's just a very rare and very complicated situation like this that we use user reference hook to handle. And this one, we console locked at that, and that's not our final target, right? Our final target is to find the target and make sure that section gets to show. So we're going to remove the console. If you're going back, this one got console.log as well, because previously in our site menu, we have this console log ID, and that one is not necessary anymore, so I just delete that. So this one's correct. And here we remove that console. And we rewrite our function as a section dot ref dot current. That'll give you that section, right? You just say in the console. Each section have a class name, right? Because we give it a class name. We just say if that class list class list, same as the vanilla JavaScript, we're gonna remove the active class name from its class list because we only want to have one active section to show at a time. So first thing we're gonna remove the active status in the class name for all sections. And then we're going to put on the active name into the section where we have targeted at. So remove active, we remove everything. And then we found the target one using an if statement. We say that if section.ref.current.id, here I used ID name because ID is unique. It cannot be repetitive. Triple equals to the target, which is the one we want to target at. Then we're going to say that section dot ref dot current. This is like a conventional combination. If you say section dot ref dot current, it will give you that section. Like what you see on the console, it will give you that section, right? Same way of you selecting the, the item in your vanilla JavaScript. Like the, uh, it will be the same as uh, get element by ID, get element by class name. It will be the same as that, this three uh, letter code. And then we want to say that section class name Plus list, we're going to add the active. Here we go, right? And then in the end, we're just going to return a section. 
So once we've done the callings, so the active status has been changed, we're just going to return that section. So this is how we write the uh, section activation function using use reference hook. We find a section, we target a section, and then we manipulate the active class name of that section. And if you go to our main.css, I'll show you why it would work. Because for each section, we do have a section.active. Initially, the section has been set to opacity 0, invisible at the beginning stage. So whenever it turns on the active status, that section gets to show, and the remaining section disappear. So this is how the CSS works, using just one line of code. We need that action. We need that active class name. So the one last job is to actually put in that active in the class name. It's a conditional rendering. How do we do that? So going back to your main, and for each one, we must conditional render that class name. For example, we go to the home section. As you can see, this one has been put on active by default. So when you trigger, the home has, doesn't have to be triggered because it's active already on our front page. And if you go to the category, this section name, the class name, only has the category. It does not have that active. But when we click the button of that navigation in our site menu, this active will be add on straight away. Why is that? Because in our main, we write this code. Whenever you click on, as long as you find the target, and that target refers to that section, that section in the class list, we're going to add that active in. right? So based on this, we're going back to the browser, reload a bit, and then we test if this is working. Home has been set to active by default, and the home section shows by default. Click on the category, pay attention, and you look at that. This one's working. The navigation has been set to active by default uh, by, by changing, and this one stands out. The styling is different, and also the section active status has been turned on. The home section disappeared. The remaining section would not show. Only the category section shows. Same for the my library, same for my back, my library, my category, and back to home. Amazing, amazing, awesome. OK, so now this is a very, very useful skill to do the page manipulation. Um, in my course for this project, I show you multiple ways of handling the web page. Not only you can change the page vertically, but also in the previous session, we demonstrate how we're going to handle the page horizontally. Right? The page can be manipulated by changing its width uh, using the toggle active function to move it horizontally. And now to move the banner section, we change it vertically. OK, so this is a very dynamic and a cool way of making that page animation. And going back to the code editor, we're just going to continue our project. So now what's our next job? Next job is to keep building our different sections. We come to the category section. The, the main structure for the web page has now been set up. So we're just going to close off the irrelevant component, like the side menu have done that part. And the main, we're going to leave it on. This one, we're going to close off. The category one is where we're targeting at. The back one comes later. So in the category, so far, we just put in the category's name. Um, but what we actually want to build in this section, if we go in there, is a lot more different stuff. We're going to have all the items listed as a card down, down here. But primarily in this part, what I want to have is the advanced filter. So when you click on the filter button, all the items should be categorized based on the filter. And over here, I want to build a search bar. Whatever letter you key in here, and the section page should reflect accordingly by the words you search. So we're going to build a filter section and also a search bar in this category page. OK, so that's our job. And going back here, delete that uh, title. And inside this category section, what we're going to do here is to first create a container. This is the Bootstrap container. We're going to make it a con container fluid. So that'll take the whole width. And just give a margin to top two. So there's a bit of a margin to set them out. And then inside the container, we're going to write a row. And inside this row, we're going to create a few columns. Because the first part is to going to show the user the filter and also the search. So the filter and the search is going to be on the same row but they take um, different sides of the area of that row. So we're going to make the filter um, take the column of 8 on a larger screen. 
And then we're going to make the other one, which is the search one. Take the column of four on the large screen. So in total, this two is going to take the entire width of that row. Uh, remember in the bootstrap setting, each row contains naturally 12 columns. So if this one take eight, and then the other one will take the remaining four, you have to calculate this on your own to make sure all the columns inside a row add up together equals to 12. It could be less than 12, but it's not supposed to be go beyond 12. Okay, and then inside that, <coughs> we're just going to write a filter. Ideally, the filter should come as a, a list. So we just say filters, create a list. And then how do you want to write a filter? Do you want to hard code every single list item here? The same logic applies as how we create our other list items like what we did in the navigation. We do not write our hard coding here. Instead, we're going to generate the list data somewhere and then map the data item into our list, right? So I have prepared the filter list data for you. And I'm just going to copy in that data into our data folder and explain. This is our filter list data. And we have a few categories. The first one is all, basically means that we want the user to see all the items without categorizing them. And then we have the, the RPG, and uh, this is the online battle, and the battle, and also the racing, the fighting. This is just a few random gaming category that I picked uh, based on the game that I select. Uh, in the real world, there are heaps of more categories that you, you can manage on your own. Um, but only the first one has been set to true by default in terms of the active class. The remaining stuff has been set to false. So based on this, we're going to import the filter list data into our category and then map it into the filter item. Okay. So back to category and on, on the top, what we do first is to import that filter list data from that. Normally it will give you that uh, reminder thing to ask you, is this the one you're going to import? If it is, you're just going to uh, key in tab and it will import it for you. And down here, <coughs> because we are handling the activation and the non-activation of the filter list data, more than likely we're using the local state. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the use state hook. And down here, we're going to generate the const filter local state filters and say set filters. That one will equal to the use state. Initially, inside the brackets, we want to pass in the initial state for the filter array, which is our filter list data. So there, I just pass in that. So this is our initial state. This is our final state based on how you want to change the states. So we manage and change the states using the set filter function. And once we manage it, the eventual or the ultimate state of the filter will be contained in the filter variable. Okay. And <clears throat> once we have that, what we're going to do is to do some sort of a mapping. So here we say curly braces filters, which is our local filter data. We're going to map map that filter error function into our filter list item. It's just going to be in a list. And in that list, what we're going to do is that we're going to give it a key which will be the filters ID, because if you look at the filter data, I have a sign ID to each individual object, which is unique and non-repetitive. And so we just put in filter ID, underscore ID. And then inside the list, what we're going to show is the, the name of the filter, right? Name of the category. So here are going to be filter.name. And if you look at it, the name is there. So we have to, you have to have this property first in your data list before you can use it. This is not just randomly created. You have predefined them somewhere in a data, in a data file. <coughs> and then once we have that, we're going back to the browser on a category. And ideally, you can see that thing comes out at the list, but it's not quite obvious because we haven't given it any styling yet, but it's there. So to make sure you can look at clearly, I'm just going to put in that CSS for now so everyone can see it. So here I put in that filter thing. We're going to make a display flex and make sure that flex uh, is a uh, wrap. 
So when the screen size shrinks, it'll wrap around on its own and give the gap different margin. And also we make sure the list items color is white, give a decent padding, make sure the text transform to uppercase. And on hover and on effect on active, whenever we hover the filter or the filter item is on active, we want to make sure that have our very special neomorphism box shadow, right? This is uh, the key design style in our project, which is that box shadow. That box shadow gives you all the neomorphism feeling. So I'm going back. At the moment, if you hover on it, you will see that uh, pops up effects. It's like a, a 3D cubic button. That's our box shadow. Yeah, that box shadow will create that effect. But uh, you haven't been able to see the active showing on because we haven't done it yet. But the filter is there. And we're going back to there. The next thing we're going to do is to create a function to deal with the on-click events of the filter. So whenever the user click on it, it should first change the active status of the filter item and then do the filter job of the actual uh, game card on that page. So let's just do it one by one. So Above, we want to write a function and to deal with the, uh, the click event. So we're just going to write over here by saying const handle filter games. And that one's going to be an error function. So inside the error function, what we're going to do, we're going to first reset the active status for the filter. And then we say that filter, this is our local variable, dot map. So for each items inside the filter array, that's going to be the filter. What we want to do is going to, we're going to set every one of them, the active status to false. So filter dot active, we have encountered this kind of situation many times. This is the professional way of doing that filter things in react.js. So we're going to set active to false first. And then we're going to find the one that we actually click on and set that one to true. How do we identify which one we click? If we're going back to the filter list data, we can either use the ID or the, the category name, right? Because the category name is unique as well. So to make things easier, instead of using ID, I'm going to just use the category because later on we have other job to do. And this parameter is most suitable. So we pass in the category as a parameter. <clears throat> now we're here. We say if our future name triple equals to the category we are clicking on, and then we want to set that filter specifically to true. So only one filter whose category matches the category we passed in, the active status is going to be set to true. The remaining filters will all be set to false. This is how the function works. Okay. And then next, we return that filter. So our array gets updated. Done. So, so far, we, what we did is that we map into our current filter array and change the active status to the one that we actually click on. But we haven't reset our filter status yet. Because remember, the use state hook, every time you change the state, you must use the, the state function to reset the state. Otherwise, the elements on your DOM won't change. So one way to do so is to uh, say, we create a new variable called new filters equals to that one. And then down the bottom, we just say <coughs> set filters to that new filters. This would make things work. And more professionally, you could save this line instead of assigning to a new variable, because this thing eventually is going to return array, right? So we're just going to wrap this entire thing directly as the parameter inside a set filter function. This is more like a complex function and nested all together, but it's a saving line of code and to make it look more fancy. So that's the way. And if we've done that, we're going to have to click on the function to trigger this. So down here in our list item, we're going to pass in on click events to trigger that filter function. So here on click equals to handle filter game, we have to pass in a parameter's name for that function to be successfully operated. So whenever you want to pass the function name in your inline code, you need to use the arrow function to call it. So the arrow function will call that uh, handle you know, 
handle future game function. Yeah. So the error function is going to be called over here, and we need to pass in one variable, which is the future category. And the future category is actually the, the future's name, which is over here. So we just access that property by saying future.name and done. So in this way, we pass in that variable, that parameter into our function. The function will be looking at mapped into the entire future list to see which future's name equals to the one that we actually click on. If, it's, if they find one, they're going to turn that one's active status to true and keep the remaining false and then update the entire future data, right? This is how we're going to do it. <clears throat> Let's just go back to the browser to see this one, if it works. It's not going to be working because we haven't set a class yet. So the one last step is to make sure that once the future status has been set to active, you want to show that active somewhere in your a future class. And where are we going to put it? We put it over here. So here we say class name. And that's going to be a conditional class name, conditional rendering. So we give it a back tick, uh, do a temporary literal. That's going to be the dollar sign and double curly braces to write a JavaScript function in it. So we say filter.active to access that active status for each one. And do a conditional rendering saying if this one is going to be true, if it's true, we show active. Otherwise, we say undefined. So once we have that, our class name can formally access the future active status, which we triggered over here. And then if it's true, we're going to show the active. And remember, by default, our all category has been set to true by default. So this one should have a standing out effect. See? Without hovering on it, the all has the box shadow already. If I click on it, whenever I, whichever one I click, um, its uh, starting style is going to change automatically. The same logic as we apply to the navigation button, we apply it again in the future. So now you should get very used to this kind of method. And now we go back. So once we're done the filter, the next thing we want to do is to write a search function. So we're just going to type in this four column part uh, of the search function of the search component. Ideally, the filter and the search should be put it onto a separate component. But for demonstration purpose, I just want to put them all on one page um, because this will make you follow up. Otherwise, if I wrap them too much into child component and another child component, you will lose in the end. I want you to learn. But uh, if you want to practice, you can wrap them around into a separate component and then do a bit of property drilling to see if the code still work. Yeah, that's a really good habit and really professional way to do it. And here we just create a new div called search. And in here, we're going to put in the input. It's going to be a type text. We give it a name to search. And we want it to have a placeholder and set it to search. So we have those three things done. And what I also want to do is to give an icon, like a zoom glass icon, so people know that's a search bar. So what we do, we're going to the Bootstrap icon website and we search that uh, search. So it has that beautiful zooming in glasses. So we're just going to have that. And then we put it right before, or you want to put it after, that's 100% OK over there. So the search component is really easy, just a few lines. And the next step, we're going to make the CSS to make it look better. So far, if you look at the browser, it's just very ugly, the organic way of writing it. So I'm going to put in the, the CSS code. That's the part for search. We'll give the placeholder a color uh, between um, white and gray, and the inline flex. So I give a bit of padding and height and width. And also, again, our magical box shadow, we'll give that a new morphism styling. And also, uh, we want to make sure the input box looks nice without any outlines or borders. And when it's a focus, the color turns to white. And the placeholder will give it color as well. Going back, and that one looks much nicer now. And if you look at it horizontally, these two items on the side doesn't really line up correctly. So I'm going to fix that right over here. You can do so in your CSS code. And also, there's an alternative way to do so using the bootstrap given thing. 
So say for example, in this column eight, if you put in this three part of the code, what does that tell you is that I want this section to be display flex, all the elements to be aligned center and also justify the content at the start. Let's save that and you will see this one aligns slightly better. And same, we want to align that four column as well. Alignment center will make sure they're both sitting at the center. However, this one I wanted to align at the end. So justify content end. And now you can see they're horizontally looking on the same line and all sitting at a, this one sits at the beginning and this one sits at the end. Okay, so that looks much nicer. The clicking is working and the searching is working. The color is correct, all good. And the rest of the thing, we have to give the genuine function or the behavior for the filter and the search. But we are unable to do so without the actual game cards. So down the bottom, below this row, we're going to write a new row. Inside this new row, um, we're going to create all of our uh, the, uh, the game cards. So here we're just going to say, give it a new row. And inside here, we want to have our new game. Because we're going to handle the categorization and also the search on this page, we're going to categorize based on the game data. And remember the game data that we fetched from the API is this JSON data, right? So when it comes, it comes as original, which is this one. But we, we need to manipulate it, handle it, search it, filter it. Do we want to change the original data or create a new copy of it and do the manipulation based on the new copy? Of course, we want to create a new copy without touching the original one, right? So what we're going to do here is instead of using that game straight away, we're going to create a new local state variable called a data and set that data to use the use state hook to the original game's data. The original game's data is what we get from this property that we have fetched from the API. And the API is on our mock URL, which is the localhost 3000 slash API slash game data dot JSON. This one, we have fetched this one. And that one has been imported into our home component, uh, into our main component. That's how we did the fetching in our previous video. Just a, a quick uh, recap. We'll fetch that and we set our game variable with that fetching data. Once we have that, the local game variable changes to the API data and we pass that game's data to each individual component and sections. So here we are dealing with uh, the category, the category get fetched the data at the games and going to the category, we just want to save that original copy without touching it. So we set a new local variable. Initially, the new local variable data will be the same as the given games data. However, later on when we do the filter and search, we're going to touch the data instead of the original games. Okay, this is, this is my logic. And once we've done that, down here, we can do a bit of a mapping. So what we say is that we're going to map the data into our cards. And each one is going to be a game. And remember, the game cards we have created in the previous video looks exactly like this. This is the beauty of React.js. Do you have to create the same card again? No, this card is reusable. So now on the second page, you want to map into the same kind of component. You just call it straight away. You save you lines of times. This is why I say for small projects, the differences between the React and the vanilla JavaScript wouldn't be that obvious. But for large and huge projects, this is, will be very, very different because you will have thousands of components on your page, maybe, and you don't want to rewrite them every time you want to use them, right? Or copy, or even copy that code is going to be a, taking you a lot of time. But this one, you don't even to copy that code. You just import that component straight away. And now we're just going to do a bracket. And inside here, we call that game card component. It's reminding you, do you want to import the game card component from the components folder? Yes, and then key in tab, close the angle brackets. And here in the mapping, you're going to have to assign a key to every single one you mapped. The key is going to be the ID, underscore ID. And also we want to pass in a variable to that uh, game card because if you look at the game card again, it actually consumes one variable called game. So you have to pass in that variable for you to consume every time you want to use it. And that game equals to 
the game over here. It makes perfect sense, right? So now you have that. And ideally, if we go back, you see, wow, all of the game that we have on board has been successfully mapped in our category page. This page is nearly finished, right? This, you don't have to repeat this card code for eight times, like how you did it in the uh, normal way. But now you can just have a one input, one mapping, all done. Really awesome. And now we have all our game cards ready. So it's now to go back to our filter and auto search to add in a few more lines of code to trigger that filter function and the search function. Uh, in terms of the filter, we have done the function already. We're just going to see how we're going to manipulate or amend this function. This function only do one job so far, which is the activate the clicked filter item to set an active status to it. But it's not doing the filtering job. So to do that, we're just going to add a few more lines down here. Below the set filter, we're going to say, first, we're going to check if the user actually click on the category of all. If they click on all, basically, we don't need to do anything, right? So we say that um, if a category triple equals to all, if that's true, we just basically want to uh, give them all the games instead of categorizing them. So we say set data using the above set data function to the original game that has been given, which is this one. This is why I don't want to touch this original game array. If we touch that, we will never have the initial copy of it, right? So we will use our like the a second version copy. So we keep the original one. So we can always go back to the original when the user click on all. And then we set that this is done. We're going to have to escape from this function. Whenever you want to escape from the function, you just type in return in JavaScript. Once you've done that, uh, the computer is going to read a lot of your code. Uh, whenever the computer reads the return, it's going to escape from the function without executing the remaining code, right? So this is a, like a, a safe protection. So we've done that. And if the user is not clicking all, we have to do the filter function. And the way to do so is that we do a another filtering, which is also a JavaScript um, higher order array function. We say games dot filter. We always want to use the original data to do the filter, right? And filter is the higher order array function. And it takes in all of our games to see which ones satisfy the criteria that we give it to them. If it satisfies the criteria and it will return a true, basically means that only the item that satisfy the criteria you give it to it will be left in our DOM. The remaining thing goes away, disappear. Okay? That's the logic. So we say we check if that game category triple equal to the category that we actually passed in here, which is the one we click on. If that's true, because this is like a, a return a boolean, if that's true, we're gonna make sure the games that satisfy this criteria will be left out, OK? And once we've done that, we have to update our data for the DOM to be updated. How do we do that? You see this set data function? We can just wrap the entire thing inside the, site, the set data brackets, put it in. We nested these two functions together. So we've done a filter job. And we, we, this filter job will return us with a new array that contains the game that satisfies this criteria, and also we update our date status. And if you check our browser, see if this works. RPG, mobile, battle, racing, fighting, it's all working good. Because I have predefined the category inside each game, uh, JSON, so each game got a category to match with the category in your filter. If the game's category this one matches that. Basically, the filter function will be true. This part will be triggered. And that item will be left in the DOM. The remaining things, which is untrue, will be filtered out. The user won't be able to see it. OK, that's the logic. So the filter has been installed successfully. And this one is simultaneously all reflects real quick. Yep. And next. We're going to do the function for the search. So we have created our search component down here. And below that um, filter function, we're going to do the search one. So every time the user key in stuff here, 
the card should be searched based on what I key in. So we use the, the game title for search. So if any letters you key in here matches the game's title, and that game will be left in the DOM, then the rest of the game will disappear. So that's what we're going to do. And here, we'll just say we create a new state variable called the text, because the input you know, deals with uh, the, the text editing. So whenever you key in stuff, that's going to be text words. And we say set text. So that one is going to be use state hook. Initially, we want to have an empty string. An empty string just double quotation, and because we haven't keyed in anything yet. And once the user key in data, we want it to change. But the way to do so is that uh, we create a function called const handle search games equals to. That's going to be an arrow function. We're going to pass in that e. E stands for events because this is going to be an input event from the input box. So this thing comes as a natural. It's a built-in parameter. You don't have to create it somewhere. It's built in in React whenever you want to use it. As long as that item has a built-in event, um, you can use that parameter. So this one here, we use that. Because in the input events, what we can get is the events target value and events target name. What we actually need is the value of it. Whenever the user input it, the value of that input box changes. So that's where we want to take that value. So we're just going to console for now, console.log e.target.value. So we want to see when the user actually key in stuff, if the, what's the value of it, how it changes. And down here, we have the input box. We have to use that function to be able to show uh, the letter has been put in. So we say, instead of saying on click, because this is not a click event, this is a text change event. So we use the built-in function, built-in event called on change, and we say handle search games. So we call that function over there. So now we have the, the fourth one. And we go back to the browser to see if we can uh, console.log that value. And we're just going to cross that. That one's back. Yep. Undefined value. Oh, yeah, of course. We haven't defined that value in Nara in this part yet. Because that e.target.value, that value is a property of that input. We haven't set it yet. So we're going to say value here to a JavaScript. That is going to be the text, which is this one. Because whenever we key in, we want the text to be changed. And when the text changes, and hopefully uh, that value gets to show on the, on the console. So I'm just going to finalize this uh, function as well. Just say that set text to that e.target.value. So this thing is called the two-way binding. So whenever we key in stuff, we change the value of in the local states. And also the local states will be reflected in the input box because the input box value equals to the local states. We use the function to change the local states. And the, the local states sets the value to the local variable. And the local variable actually gets presented in the input box as a value. So this is like a two-way binding. I control you, you control me. Okay. So now as we have that, the console should be working. And I just noticed there's a tiny apple, uh, a typo. Uh, target. I will just type one letter A. So now we go back, clean our console to see if it works. As you can see in the console, whatever I type in, it gets console.log. Okay, that's the letter I put in exactly over here. This one is working. This is what we call the two-way binding. And clean it up. So we have our search function working its own way. But the next thing is that we haven't done the search job yet. The search job, we have to use the letter that has been keyed in here, which is the value, and to use that value to do another filter function to our game class to see which game class title contains the value that we put in here. So instead of a console.log that, I'm just going to write another filter function to handle the search. We say games.filter brackets. Another mapping 
another filtering, this is also the higher order array function. We want to see each game to see each game's title, because the title is a game property. We can access that using a period. First thing, very important, whenever you want to use the key in value, the text words to do filtering, you must make sure um, it's case sensitive or not. In our case, we cannot guarantee that the user always type in the same as how we build our name. We build our name all in uppercase. What if the user type in the lowercase? And more than likely, they'll be typing lowercase. And we're going to turn everything into the same case. So the title, we want to say to lowercase. Close that. So now it's a safe. If that thing which has been turned to lowercase, we use the JavaScript function includes which will test the string. This is a string function. We will test if one string will include another substring. OK, this is how, the, how it works. Includes the e.target.value. And we have to turn the user's input into a lowercase as well. What if the user type in the hybrid, some capital letters combined with some lowercase letters? And we just want to make sure they're all consistent. Otherwise, the search will fail most of the time. So we turn their thing into a lower value. And we turn our thing into a lower value. If our string, this is a game title string, include the user's type in letter, we're going to leave those game out on the DOM. The remaining game will disappear. OK, so this is how we reset the game's array. But once we've done that, we have to set the data. Remember, we use our local data variable to host the actual game to be presented on the DOM. So we're going to cut, set data. And inside the curly brackets, we put in that filter function and save. So now, whenever the user key in words, we're going to do the filter job. And then we're going to reset our text. So the two-way bonding should be working, and a searching function should be working as well. Let's just go back to the browser to see if it works. Uh, maybe you want to try the Mario one. Yeah, it works straight away. You see, it's really, really quick. This one is instantaneous, right? It has no pending time, no loading time. It's not like the old way when we um, write stuff and we have to wait to the backend to respond, because all the backend data will be firstly rendered into your DOM. So we're using our local variable to do the search instead of the backend fetching to do the search, right? So in a real project, it will also be this quick. There will be no delays. And Mario and Dota works very, very fine, right? King, King of Fighters, I've been playing that for years. And League of Legends, yeah, that's, I reckon that one should be good. I'm not a very good at playing these sort of games. Maybe the Mario one's still OK. And yeah, we have our filters ready, and we have our um, search bar ready as well. This part is all cool, all good. So at least the, when you first learn React.js, you should learn how to handle filtering things, how to handle the text input, and how to use that text input to do a bit of a searching. This is like a um, not a basic level of skills. I would say the standard level of skills in the React developers field. So that's done. And the thing I want to still mention again is that this filter should be rewrapped into a separate component. And you import that, you inject that component here. And this search section, div, this part, should be rewrapped into a separate component as well. And you inject it here by passing in all of those properties. But it'll cost us more time and code. But so what I want to do is that I leave you this as a practice so you can wrap around on your own to see after wrapping uh, to a separate component if your code is still working OK. OK? And now, so this page is done. Our next one uh, is going to be the libraries and the bags. So these two few parts. Whenever we click on the Like button, which is the heart, uh, we want the animation to change. First, we want this top corner Like icon. You see there's a little badge down the corner. We want that number increase to how many items you like. So if you click three items, that thing should change to three. OK? And the second animation is that whenever you like something, that thing should be added into your library page. I want it to, we want that item to be shown here, right? So there's two things we need to handle. And the same logic for the back, uh, we, but we come to that later. How are we going to do that? First, let me uh, close off a few things that is irrelevant. The category is pretty much all done. We're not going to touch it again. The future list data, not anymore. The home one, the home we already finished, not again. So the game card, we're probably going to leave it, because later on, we're going to do more functions added to the game. Uh, remember, if you look at DOM, this card is a really, really sophisticated card that contains too many features. You need to build in that handle click events for the like button, and also the handle click events for the add to back button, and all of the rest stuff we have done in the previous session. 
So we leave that one on. We leave this one on. So in this part, I'm going to introduce some more fancy uh, React hook for you. Because if you think about it, um, our card is used pretty much everywhere on our web page. In the home page, we have the card. The user should be allowed to like it and add it to back on our home page. And also, if we go, if they go to the category page, they are supposed to like it and add to back on that page as well. So there will be too many places um, that will allow the user to do these two jobs. If we just restrict the behavior of the like and the add to back into some local component, that's going to be very, very messy when you write a code. So ideally, the item in the back and the item in the library should be stored somewhere globally and shared across all over the page, right? Any, any layer, any component, any places on your browser should be able to touch the library item and the back item. So if that's the kind of case, we're not going to use the use state hook to build a local variable and handle the things locally. What I want to do is that we're supposed to build some global variable to store the items or the arrays in the back and store items for the back. How do we do that? And this is the time I need you to reopen your app.js file again, because we're going to build a super global things and use a very, very useful um, use React hook called use context hook. OK, so here in app.js, what we're going to do, we're going to build our local state in that app file and then pass that local state variable using the use context hook. So every component at every layer of your app can share it and use it. So this is going to be use state. And here, right down the bottom, I'm just going to export one line, export the const. We'll give it a name. This name is up to you. App context. Make it equal to react.create context. Close bracket. So that one line of code allows you to create a context, which is a global environment. And that context is going to be used to store any variables or values that you want to share with the entire application, regardless of the layer of the component. OK? And then what we do here, because thinking it um, logically, essentially, the libraries and the back is going to be what kind of data? It's going to be an array, right? It's going to be an array, a new array that will contains the things you like, a new array for the back that will contain the things you add to the back. So this will be two empty array. So over here, we're just going to create some global variables to store those empty array. And that will be the first one, const library, and then set library. So we have those two. And that one equals to use state. Initially, it's going to be an empty array because nothing in your bag and nothing in your library, right? So on the, on the next line, we create another local state called back, which stores our back array and the set back. We're going to set it to use state. And that's going to be an empty array as well initially. So these are local in terms of uh, the app.js file, but we're going to share it using the use context hook across the chain. How are we going to share it? Uh, this is where you do a bit of a wrapping in this bit. So far, we're just going to use the app to wrap our main, but we're going to cut it, build a brackets. Inside it, we put in this angle brackets where we want to have multiple stuff to wrap. And right above, we say app context dot provider. And then we close that bracket. Once you close it, supposedly, it should give you that closing tag automatically. And then you wrap your main inside that provider. OK? So this is how we use that use context hook. You build that context hook first. You export it. And you use this provider to wrap everything inside. What it means is that everything gets wrapped inside that provider. We will be able to use the value you want to share inside that use context hook. So what value we want to share? Here, you're going to tell the computer the value that I want to share with all the rest of the components are equal to. This is going to be a JavaScript, and it contains the JavaScript objects. The first one is going to be our library, which is our local state variable. The second one is going to be the set library, which is the local state variable function. And the third one is going to be our back 
and the last one is going to be our setback. So those are the four things that we want to share across every single component on our DOM, right? So with that, you don't need to bother to see uh, the property drillings. You don't need to worry about it. Whenever you want to use that library, you can just call from the contact drill away. No local state ever going to be built and uh, no local state function ever going to be right. So we're going to use the global one. While well, people might feel that it is so exciting and amazing, and from now on, I will give up my uh, use state hook and use that use contact hook all the time. No, that's not the case. Some behavior is very local. It only belongs to that local component, and you should not share it across. Okay, these two things are global items uh, that's going to be shared across all layers. That's why we build it globally. Okay, it's just a different technique and skills going to be used for the right situation and the right time. Right. So as a developer, we should be able to do in a professional way. So we have that. And going back to the browser, it looks all okay. So it basically means that it has no box in it. And the first place we want to use that is going to be um, in our category or our card. Let me think about it. Essentially, you want to trigger everything probably in your cards because the card is going to handle the like. The card is going to handle that add to back, right? So we write things first, check if we need to change anything in our game card. So here we go, inside our game card, what we want to do is going to, because we're going to use the, the global variable that we shared using the use context hook, we're going to have to take in those variables first. So firstly, you're going to ask computer to import that use context hook in React. And the next step is that we're going to tell the computer which context variable we're going to use, which is the app context. We import app context from app. So why we can import that? Because if you look at it, we export that. This keyword, if you miss it, it won't work. It's not just like you create one context variable. You, have, you must create a variable and also you export it. Okay, You export the context variable so where you can import it as other component. Once you have those, and inside your function, you will say const. This is going to be an object of destructuring because remember the way that we share the global variable in the app is through the value which contain the, the variable objects. So here we're going to take that value as an object as well. Do the object destructuring. We're going to use that uh, library. We're going to use this one and we're going to use the set library. And also, we're going to use the uh, the back. I'm just going to load everything for now because essentially this card is going to be very, very uh, sophisticated. Um, we're going to use all the global variables. So all these variables come from where? Using that use context hook to call that app context. This is how it works, right? In the app.js file, we create the app context. And we know that app context provides these values as a single object. And we import that variable here, that uh, context here, and then we fetch those variables from that context using that use context hook, right? This logic is very clear now. So once you have that, you basically whatever you created in the app, you can have the same thing, exact the same thing at here. You have that function, you have that state variable, state function, everything's the same. And the next step is that we're going to deal with the like button first. How are we going to do that? <clears throat> Whenever we like something, we wanted to put it into the library array, right? We're going to reset the library to the new array, which contains the item that has been liked. So over here, there's a teeny tiny part of the code, which looks trivial in the previous session, and now becomes a very sophisticated one. So you want to add in a new click function to this angle tag. So whenever the user click it, you must trigger an add to back function or add to library function, right? So here we write, const handle add to library equals to game because that's going to take a game object as the parameter. We need to tell which game we need to add to the library. So that's what it takes as a parameter. So that's going to be another error function. Curly braces. It's a very easy way to update that library array. We're just going to say set library. To a new array which contains the game that has been added. 
So here we use the JavaScript array spread operator. The spread operator dot 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 means that I want to copy every single thing in the previous array. So if I say dot 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 library, basically means that every single item in the previous library array will be copied here in the new array. But on top of that, I need to add a new item called game. See, this is how it works. And in that way, you will have a new array which contains the old item exactly the same and also the new game which just been added into this array. And then you update your library array using that set library function and done. That one line of code will solve all your problem. You can add your game to the library array straight away. Okay, cool. So once we have done that, um, we're just gonna trigger that click function over here. So here we say on click. This is gonna be another arrow function. So in this arrow function, we say handle add to library. And here we pass in that game. The game wouldn't be a problem because we are doing mapping already. This game is a taking property of the game card. We can use it everywhere. And why don't we just add the entire game objects as the item into that library array. So here it has no problem. So once we add it, that library array should contain this item. So you, want, you probably want to see in the browser now, but not yet because the library array now contains the game that we just click on and add it, but we haven't presented in the library page, right? So the next step is for us to go to the library page. Here we only show the library title, which is not the one we want. We have to map the library array on this page. So to do that, the easiest way is to use what? Is still to use that uh, library array uh, context variable. But if you think about it, should we use that context variable right over here or in its parents component? Because the library's parents component is the, the main component. As you can see, the library takes everything from the main component. Right now, it's taking that as a game, which is the, the initial game that we fetched from the backend URL. This is not what we want. So ideally, this library should take the game from the library array and the back should take the games from the back array, which is the two global context variable that we just built, right? So we're gonna uh, call that context variable on our parents page, which is the main page. So right at the top, and I intentionally want to use this page to write everything because I want to show you that in our course, in this project, we have used all the major hooks in React.js. The use state hook, use effects hook, use reference hook, and use context hook. There are a few other hooks, that is, uh, but it's not as popular as this four. Uh, these four are the most popular hooks in React. And in one course, you have learned all of them. So we import that use context hook. And then the second step is over here. We're going to have to, uh, uh, we haven't uh, done the uh, context importing. Once we import a hook, we're going to import the, the app context. We have to import a context. And then down here, we can do the object destructuring to have that use that context hook to call the context. Here we go. So which value we want from that context? Do we need a function or just a variable? Let's just say we just need a, the variable. So one is the library, the other one is the bag. So now we have the library, we have the bag, which is the two array that contains all the locked item and the, the shopped item. These two item, two, two variable, should be passed as a game and then mapped into our category section and uh, uh, mapped into our library section and the back section. So here we should pass in the library instead of the original games. And here we should pass in the bag instead of the original games. And now it should be working all fine. So if we go back to the my library, now it takes the game. You don't have to touch this game, this property name, because it's the same. Look at the main. We didn't change the property name. We just changed its value. And here, what you can do is instead of writing the library, we can map that game on this page now, which is a very easy job. I think even without looking at my video, you can do the mapping on yourself. But I'm still going to show you how to do it. So I'm just going to uh, do a bit of a cutting. I'm just going to cut this part and write my code. So here we're going to build a div and we wrap everything inside the container uh, fluid. And inside here, we give it a row and uh, that make sure the row has a bit of a margin to the bottom. We set it to three. 
which is the median one. And then we put in our title. So that our title is wrapped in a row, which has a modern to bottom. And then down below, I'll say that we do the mapping. The map also going to be, all the cards has to be holding the row to make it look decent. So we do the row, and then inside here, we do the curly braces to write JavaScript. And the problem is that, are you always sure that, that the user going to like something? What if they do not like anything on your page? You're going to end up with an empty array in your library, right? Remember, this game comes from the main, which is our library array. The library array can be empty array if the user didn't click anything. So we have to do the conditional rendering. First, we're going to check the, the library array's length. So that's going to be game.length. If the length triple equals to 0, if that's true, we're going to render something like your, your, your library is empty, something like that. So we're just going to say the h2, and your library is empty. Um, this is just for education demonstration purpose. I just put one line of uh, text words here. In the real world, if the card is empty on a, uh, on a library is empty, you want to show a bit of a cartoon or animation or some specific CSS styling, that's 100% okay. You just put your code here. Sometimes nowadays, people are using SVG image instead of the, uh, the text word, and you can put your own stuff in this yellow bracket and then replace. If it's empty, we're going to show that word. If the length is not zero, we're going to actually map it. So now, another yellow bracket. And here we say games.map. And map we say game, arrow function. What do we want to map it into? Good question, right? Think about inside our library, we want to present the locked item as a game card. What is a game card? The game card is the one that we built before, right? So this is the beauty of it. The game card we built it in our first session has been used on three pages of our website. And without React, it's very hard to achieve this purpose. I would say at least you need to double your work, triple your time to, to achieve the same result. But this is save heaps of things. You just need to import that game card component over here. So we say game card, import, close the angle brackets, done. And just double check above it has been imported successfully from the right directory. And inside the game, the game card takes variables. It takes a game variable, right? We have to pass in that uh, property. First, to give the key. We use that game underscore ID. And then we're going to pass in that game as the property. So done. Right? All of your library array contains the game. The game is mapping to game card and showing on your, in your library back. It's 100% OK. So now if we go back to that uh, category, you know, and we're going back to the category on that page, I just noticed a tiny problem. If we reload the page, this one wouldn't show initially up front. Uh, but if we click the button, it shows. It's just like a tiny uh, little bug here. Um, I'm going to fix that right now before we're going on. Um, the problem is called by the data loading. We load our data in our main part, and we fetch data here, set our game data using a set game function. So our local game variable has been set to that API data, which we fetch from the JSON URL, this one. That's what we did in the previous session. So once we've done, done that, um, for us to use that data, we haven't done the protection checking to use it. What is the protection checking? Pretty much whenever you want to use that data in your sub component, you have to double check if the, the game data has been loaded successfully. Say, for example, we need to say if the games exist and also if the game's uh, length um, greater than zero. So basically, if the length is greater than zero, that means it has some item in it. It's not an empty array, right? We must make sure the game is not an empty array before we pass that into our subcomponent. If those are all true, true C, then we're going to render our home component. So here, I'm just going to put it back in. That's how we're supposed to do it in a very professional way. Okay, And I didn't touch on that because I just want to run this uh, tutorial. But it looks like that if we do not touch that, uh, the, the home page is going to be OK, always there. But for the category, when we first rendered the DOM, the category wasn't rendered. So the, the game wouldn't be loaded on this page. It wouldn't affect the home page, but it will affect the remaining page. So that's how we fix the bug. So once we've done that, I would say that um, 
maybe we do it in this way. We wrap everything inside here. That's going to give us an arrow. But what I will do, remember I told you that we can use this uh, magic angle brackets to wrap everything. So those things will be treated as one single item. I'll see if that works. Yeah, you see, once I refresh the page, the category shows straight away without hiding items and all the buttons working. Cool. So now we have built that. Just a quick recap, we have built that uh, uh, add to library function inside our game card. So whenever I click the like button, this function will be triggered and the library array will be reset to this new array with the new game being liked. And we present in our library of the library array and we mapped into another card. And hopefully when we click the like button, this time it should work. And let's just test it right now. So going back to the browser, I just randomly click the Mario one. You wouldn't see the text color and the font color change because I haven't set a CSS yet. But if you go to the library, the one that we just clicked has been there. It's added successfully to the library. Okay, so this one is absolutely working. So try another one and go to library, it's there, right? So we have successfully done the adding function. Now going back to the game card, what we want to do is that uh, you, you can add it and you can remove it. So you're going to have to uh, do a bit of a toggle. When you add it, you should turn this uh, like icon, the color to the cyan. And if you toggle it again, if you go back to uh, white, so we need to handle the color change. And also we need to allow the user to remove the item by re-toggle it inside our library so they can remove it. So the second function I'm going to write inside a card component is the remove. So here, just down below, we say const handle remove from library equals to you're also going to take a game parameter because we, we need to know which one needs to be removed very easy and the remove I'm going to be different from the previous one we're using a different function called um, filter so we say set library and inside we write that filter function because we want to filter out that item and leave the remaining stuff. How do we do that? So we take the library array and pass in that filter function which is the higher order array function and we check each item in it. As long as the item in it, that item ID does not equal to the game ID that we want to be removed of from our library will keep those things stay. You understand? So we're going to find out which one ID does not equal to the one that we want to remove will get those things stay in our library. This is uh, the opposite way of syncing it because we are removing stuff, not adding stuff. So we want to keep the things that is not equal to the one we want to kick out. So that's why we say unequal underscore ID. And now the library array will filter out all of those not equal to the one you want to kick it out and keep those inside the library array and update the library data, the, the library status. Okay, so once we've done that, uh, we have to trigger the click function over here because so far in the click function, we just clicked the add events. We have to somehow put in the removal events here as well. So how do we do that? You only have one line of code to trigger one function at a time. This is called conditional triggering the function. In React, everything is possible. Nothing is impossible, okay? So let me show you how to do the conditional triggering of that function. Uh, we still need that. We're just gonna cut it for now because we're gonna write more code. I'm just gonna put it on a separate line. So inside here, what I will do, I will say library. First, I will check if my current library array include the item you want to click on or like already. So I use the include function of that game. Basically what it means, if the library already include the game you want to like, can you like it again? Are you allowed to like twice? Or basically saying that you will have two same game card being added to the library page. Are you allowed to do that? No, you're not going to like the same thing twice unless this app does not allow you. Okay, you can either like it or dislike it. That's it. 
So if the library already include contains your game, and then we're not going to allow you to do it again. You, if you click on that like button, basically means you want to remove it. So if this one is true, the thing we want to trigger is the remove library of that game. However, if the library does not include your game, basically you never liked this game before, and you click on the like button, what are you going to do? You're going to include that thing into the library already, right? So we're going to have to do a second part, which is a conditional rendering, and then we add to that library that game. So this is how we conditionally trigger the function, depending on if the library has included the game you want to like. So once we've done that, we should be able to handle the both add and removal function. Let's just test it out, test it out in our browser. So going back to our browser, so now I'm just click on the, uh, the League of Legends, like that one, and also the Super Mario, like the second one. And if we go to our back of the library, you will see those two items there. Adding is working. So now if I click again, the legend is gone. Click this one again, the Mario is gone. So basically the removal is working as well. You see, this is how we write things. Well, some people would like to uh, handle those things in one function using the if. We can put that if the condition inside one function to test it out. It would also work, but really depending on how you want to write a code. But this one is just uh, for demonstration purpose and it is because we are running a tutorial, this is more um, easier probably for you to comprehend. So I write it separately. So once we've done that, what else we need to do? We need to set up the colors, right? Um, the colors for the like, if it has been liked, we should turn it to green. If it has not been liked, and we should set it to the white color. And how do we do that? It's going to be another conditional rendering. So we just cut the existing static class name, and then we give a, a curly braces because we're going to do back tick. Put in the static name and then money sign, double curly braces to trigger the JavaScript. And then the same logic apply. <laughs> How do we know that if the user has already liked it or not? We use this one, right? If the library includes that game, of course the user has already liked it. Otherwise, the user never liked it before. So we put it over here. If the library includes that game, that basically means the user has already liked it. And then we turn on that active class. Otherwise, we'll say undefined. That's it. One line of code solves all the problems. So once we turn on that active class in CSS, we're going to handle the color of it. Let's just double check in the color.css how we handle that uh, color for that like. Yes, we did. So like on active class is going to show the color of that uh, cyan. And we go back to the browser, click that again. You see that one changes. Click that again. That one changes to cyan. And we go into the library. They both change. We're going to the home. Home is not changing because we haven't touched the home yet. That one has been changed. And we can perfectly remove that, has no problem. Okay, so this is all good. Right, back to our component. So we have now finalized the uh, uh, add to library section. And our website looks on more than halfway has been finished. So this one's all working. I just want to play around for now to see if any bugs are left. Uh, back then, I just reload the page. Actually, uh, the home page is working as well. If you add your item from the home, and the library still shows, and that one goes away. And if you click on any items you want to like, not only this color will change on your category page, the home page will change as well. Of course, those two items are not on the home page, so we just deselect those. Select the first two, and it goes to your home page, and you will see magically those colors same as well. It's supposed to be, because we are using the same game card. So that's the beauty of a reusable component. Any style changes to it, it's going to apply everywhere. You don't have to worry about the code. Do, do I need to change here? Do I need to change there? No, it, it, it applies everywhere. So if you go to the library, that thing's there, remove it off, works all perfect. So one last thing we haven't done yet is that this batch number, this batch number should be able to show how many um, inside, but we'll leave it to the end once we finalize the back because these two are supposed to be handled in the header section altogether. We'll leave it to the end. So now let's move on to the back. So the back one is a slightly different from the library uh, because the library, we toggle the item. So we can add it and we click the same area to remove it. But for the back, we add it on the card, but we remove it, not on the card, we remove it in the back section. Supposedly, here's going to be the shopping bag list, which is going to be a, a table that contains all the items being added to your shopping bag. 
So now let's just create that one. And the first step is uh, we're going to create an add function similar to this add to library. If you want to do it yourself, you can pause the video now and try it on your own. Otherwise, I'm just going to be um, typing in this button. This is our add back button. We're going to type in that uh, add to back function. So right below that library, we say that const uh, handle add to back. And then we say that equals to game because we're going to take the same logic, except that we change the array. Instead of using the library array, we're using the, game, the, the back array. And then that one equals to that. So we say set back. And inside, we give it a new array, uh, spread operator uh, to copy the existing back array. And then we're just going to add in that new game done. So these two line, this, this few functions is really fancy functions that only take one line of code, but can do a really super good job. Right? This is the beauty with the higher order array function or order state variables. You cannot have this uh, in the vanilla JavaScript. So once you've done that, and another thing to think about, uh, do we allow the user to add the same item twice? Um, this is a, a tricky scenario. In this project, I say no. In other projects, I would say yes, because it's a digital product. It's an online game store that user added to their store. Once they pay, they can download that game on their computer. And once they download that, they have the right to use that digital product forever. They, there's no need for them to buy it a second time. Once they have it, they have it, right? Even though they want to uh, buy another copy, they have to sign in with a different account, not the same user account. This is how we experienced with the digital store. And if that's the situation, we should check if the bag has contained this game that you basically means the user has already added to the bag. If so, we're not going to allow the user to add the game. And but for other e-commerce websites, this is probably not a case. If you are selling physical items, like uh, you're selling the bikes, you're selling motor vehicles, and you're selling clothes, and you you should allow the user to increase the quantity in their shopping bag. So really depending on the situation. So in this case, we we'll just put a uh, a safety lock. If the bag has includes that game you want to add in, we simply return. Return means that the remaining code will not be executed. Uh, the program will jump out of this function and run the remaining stuff. So once we've done that, we're just going to copy that function name and we go to the uh, the uh, the actual place that we want to trigger the on click events. So here we say on click. That's going to be another JavaScript already in. And then we say we trigger that function, arrow function, put that function name in, give the brackets and pass in that game variable, then tell the computer which one we want to add to the bag. So once we've done that, our bag should have that stuff. And we can't test it now because we haven't set our bag section. So let's just go to our page in the bag. So far, we're just presenting that uh, um, my bag title. I'm just going to do a bit of a quick coding to have this section all build up. So here, the same logic. I'm just going to cut that. And we'll say div.container. Actually, you know what? The section title is quite repetitive. It has been reused on pretty much all the sections. You can rewrap it to a separate component and name it section title. Okay. So this is going to be another your own practice. But for this course, I'm just going to leave on the, on the same page and focus on the main thing because I don't want to get you distracted too much. And leave it in the container. Once we have that, we create a row and give a margin bottom number three. And inside it, we put in that title. So our title will take the fluent container and the whole row. And once we've done that, the next step, we're going to set up our JavaScript for the mapping. <clears throat> Here, the first thing we're still going to do the checking, if the game dot length triple equals to zero, if it's zero, basically means that we have nothing in our shopping bag. And we're going to return the user with one line of words and telling that um, your, your shop card is empty or your bag is empty. And that done. So and then we're going to do a colon. Uh, the remaining code is going to be our key shopping list table, right? We're going to write everything wrapped in that angle brackets. So we set a structure. And inside here, 
what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a table. So we say we set a new row, and then we're gonna wrap that with a div uh, with a table responsive. This is a the bootstrap table. I just use their layout because it's really handy. If you want to use a CSS to design a responsive table, that's gonna take you heaps of lines to achieve the target. But uh, the bootstrap has a built-in table responsive feature. If you wrap the table with that uh, class name, and all the table will be very responsive, even the screen size shrinks to the mobile small. And then inside, we're just gonna do a table. Class name, shop back table tab. And we're gonna use that table class. This table class is the bootstrap built-in table class. And also we're gonna use the uh, table dash borderless. We don't want any border for our table. This is also the bootstrap class name. And also uh, align model to give a, a nice and neat alignment. This is the bootstrap class as well. The, only the first one is our own customized class name, the remaining all bootstrap stuff. And then down here, we're just gonna put in that table head. To save a bit of time, I'm just gonna copy and paste in the table head. The T head represents this is gonna be the head heading of your table. So once we've done that, we're gonna do the body. Because inside the T body, we're gonna have our mapping, right? So the game that we take from the outside, which is the, the back array, this game is the back array. Remember in our in our main, we pass in the game property to the back component, which is the our the back array. So here we're just gonna map that array. We say game dot map. And our second thought you think about um, you're gonna map it into this table uh, row item. Is this gonna be a separate component or do you want to write it over here? It's absolutely gonna be a separate component, right? So jump into your component folder, create a new file, and name it shop back item JSX. RFCE, create a boilerplate, and then very quick, uh, we're gonna create that uh, CSS file as well. Shop back item CSS. Going back to your component, import that CSS. So we have that, and we have the, a simple name content in it. We're gonna add it a bit more inside this uh, shop back item uh, because what the table row contains is gonna be our uh, um, item number. It's gonna be the image or the preview image of that game, the original price, the discount, the, the price after discount, and a delete button, right? So inside here, we are going to show a tr, which is a t table row. So I would just say the tr dot shop back item tab. So now we're gonna pass in all of our row stuff. And the first one we're gonna pass in is a th. And this one's gonna be a scope of row. And that one is a bootstrap thing. That'll make your um, table look nice and neat. So here we're gonna put the, how many number of items you have. This is uh, the count of your item. And the, the first row will be the first item, second row will be the second item. So, so far I'll just leave a number one there. So hard coding, later on I will change the dynamic. And the second one I'm gonna pass in is the TD. And that one is going to hold our image, the preview image. But where does the image coming from? Think about in our back, we're gonna map our game into that shopping bag component. So over here, we're just gonna say map game, fed arrow into that component. Uh, we we'll do a bracket, and here we say shop back item. Close that bracket. So that's all done, and. Because we're gonna know the sequence of that item inside your uh, table list, so we're gonna use the not only the game variable, but also the index, which is the building variable of the higher order array function. We're gonna pass all of those in. 
So here there's quite a few properties to be passed in. We're going to pass in the index as the index. It starts from the zero. And we're going to pass in. This is not a pass in. This is just a required stuff. We're going to give that a key whenever we want to do mapping. Underscore ID. And then we're going to do the game. We're going to pass in the entire game. So now our shop back should have three properties, actually two, because this one is required by React, not going to be used anymore. So we're going to have the index. We're going to have the game. As soon as we have those, we're going back to the shop back to do a property uh, destructuring. We will destruct the game and also the index. So here I just put a one, but now I can use JavaScript to code it. We want the index of that game plus one. Why? Because the index starts from zero. If you have one item in your shopping cart, shopping bag, that item should sh present one instead of zero because it starts from zero. So we manually add one on it. So everyone increase by one. And the second part is the image. Here we want the image not only equal to a empty string. We gave it a we want a game preview image. And this property coming from our JSON. Remember, each game object has an image property, and we're just going to access it here. Alt, if you don't want to put anything, you can leave it blank. Uh, class name, we'll give it the image fluid, so it can uh, respond autom automatically. This is the bootstrap class. Done that. And then we'll just keep going with the rest of the TD, which is the, uh, the table body cell. This TD, what we're going to put in another cell is going to be the game title. So once that's done, in the next one, what we're going to put in is the uh, game price, game dot price. If you put in like this, that's going to be look at the price, what it looks like, fifty two point fifty six. So that's going to be very very um, ugly. So what we can do is we give a bit more decoration. We, we put a money sign before it, and we make sure that uh, only goes to two decimal places. So we use the fixed function to make the decimal place of two. Just in case, because later on you're gonna do calculation of the discounted price. What if the price after calculation has many many decimal places? You want to restrict it. And then TD another one. This one you want to show the discount. So the discount game dot discount is it gonna be good enough? No. If you look at the JSON, the discount shows as a, uh, per, a decimal place, but we want to show the percentage. How do we do that? We're just going to say times 100 and give a percentage sign outside the curly braces. And then the last one, not the last one, the second last one is the price after discount. Money sign, double curly braces. So here we're going to say calculate how much the item should be after discount and keep the two decimal place. So what we're going to do, we're going to say game price uh, times another bracket, we use a 1 minus the discount rate. 1 minus game dot discount and the times the original price will be the price after discount, right? simple math. Once we've done that, to fix, to, this is all the chain functions. So you keep the two decimal place as well, for, especially for this one, because after the discount calculation, more than likely it will have the unpredictable numbers of place of decimals in that figure. And the last one, TD, we're going to give an angle tag. And in here, there will be a uh, delete button. So this is the place we actually allow to delete the shot back atom. So we're going to the bootstrap icon. And then I just want to find a delete. So as a heap of things, I just personally like this one, but you can choose anything in your favor. And we put it in over there. Right? So now we've pretty much finalized our shopping bag item, which will be mapped in a in the table body. The heading is hard coded. If you want to, if you want to, uh, this thing can be uh, built dynamically as well. You just create a, a data file called uh, table head data and you'll map that through. It's 100% OK. But for this course, I just uh, leave it on as a hard coding. So once we've done all of those, let's see. Of course, currently our, our back is empty. But I remember we have done the add to back function. If I click on 
quite a few to see if uh, yeah, you can see this one's working now. All the items that we just click on has been added into this one, but it looks super, super scary because we haven't done any CSS yet, but at least we know our um, shopping cart is working. So the next step is to uh, do our shopping cart. I'm gonna close few, I'm gonna close the category, the app. Those are the thing we're not gonna use for a while. So in our bag, so just gonna some basic CSS and to be used to control our table. I'm just gonna put in shop back table, shop back on T head, and also the T head, the row. This is gonna be restricting the font size and color and also padding and margins. So going back to the back, and we look at a class name, this is gonna be our shop back table. So all the things is targeting at there. And once we've done that, um, we also wanted to do the uh, CSS for the item. So for the shop list the item, there's only a few lines of code to finish all the job. We're gonna give a margin. We're gonna control its row. Uh, also it's a cell. Make sure the color is white. And also uh, we wanna control that anchor tank. Uh, make sure it's color is white. Specifically, importantly, you need to control that image because it's over large. So I want to make sure it has a, a proper width and also a decent height. Object fit cover, position center. So once you've done those, you will see that beautiful table is there. We also with that new morphism, standing out the cubicle effects, given that we have put on the box shadow. Really, really cool, awesome. So now the table item change. The last job is to handle that remove button because we want to remove item from the, uh, the table as well. So what we can do here is in our shop back item, um, you need to think about where is the proper place to raise that event. This doesn't really matter now. Why is that? Because by dealing with the global variable, remember the data got mapped from the global variable bag, which we created and passed in, use that to use a context hook. So here again, we're gonna access those variable, use that to use context hook. And then down here, we're just gonna import that uh, app context from app. And then access those two context variable by this object destructuring back and the set back. Those are the things that have been pre-built and we just gonna access that from the app context. Done. So once we've done that, we're just gonna write a remove function and put it onto the uh, click button here. So const handle remove from back. Uh, this is also gonna be a arrow function. And we know that the job is gonna be very easy, it's just gonna be the future function like before, set by set back, and then we say back.filter. We want to filter through each items inside that bag array. And we want to find out if any bag items ID does not equal to the one that we actually want to pass in, uh, which is the variable game here, which is the one we want to remove, game dot underscore ID. So we only want to keep the item whose ID does not equal to the one that we want to remove from the bag inside our bag array. So those things will get stayed and present it on the DOM, right? So that's the logic we want to use. Very simple. Now once we've done that, so we're just going to put that uh, click function over here, install it. So on click, inside the array, going to be an arrow function to trigger that function. I'll just call handle remove from back and passing that game variable to tell which game to remove. These code are gonna be super, super uh, messy and complicated if you ever try to write those with the uh, vanilla JavaScript or somebody build their code with PHP or other languages. But anyhow, inside the React, this is perfectly handled, I would say. With a very limited job, number of jobs, and uh, the effects really decent. 
So once we've done that, we are supposed to test out those. I uh, haven't been able to remove it. Let's see what's going on. And that is because I forgot to put the ID here. Yeah. So we only want we want to match the ID. The item ID who's uh, not which is not equal to the one we want to move out will get stay. That's the future criteria. And after that, yeah, you see it look works perfectly fine. And now it's gone. That empty is uh, em that back is empty. So we're going back, add a few more stuff to see if it's working. And that one, add the Spider Man and also the Diablo. Uh, my back. Those three items there. Perfect. Awesome. Right? So the last bit for the back is the adding the item count and also the total price count and also add a uh, checkout button. So let's just do that. Go back to our back. And we already done that. So we're just going to add one new row to handle that job. And below that row of table, we write a new row. And in which we have two things to show. So we give a, a column two, uh, which is going to take the uh, total item count. And the other one, we're going to give a column of 10. This one, we will take all the rest of the stuff um, in which we will have our payment. And in payment, we're going to have the total. And also, uh, after total, we're going to have a anchor tag, which holds our uh, checkout button. If you're using Stripe or Payout, uh, the PayPal, sorry, or any other external API, this is the place where you probably want to uh, link in that API and pass in all the price data to that API so you can have the customer link to the, uh, the checkout page, uh, which is another story. I'm not going to show you those things in this course because I don't want to um, overload too much in the beginning course. This is um, just get you to start it on the React. So later on, when we're getting um, deeper and deeper, I will show you how to build a full stack e-commerce website and we will introduce those payout functions come to that. So here we put in checkout and ideally I'm going to put in the logo or the icon. We don't know which specific company is going to handle this so I'm just going to put in the wallet icon. If you have something on mind, you can put in anything you like. So here I'm just going to put in that wallet and then give the class name. So, so far so good. We have uh, put in our things. So here we're going to put in is the total item. And this two we're going to put in a, in a paragraph called item count. And then we put total items colon back to the browser. And you can see those two things there. But it doesn't look right because we haven't done the CSS part. So very quickly in the back, I'm going to put in a CSS. The CSS for that um, item count, we're just going to do a bit of control on the font size and the payment. I want to make sure the color is 50%. Uh, the color is white and the gap is 50% and display inline flex. And also for that button, the checkout button, Anchor tag. We want to, to we wanted to have that new morphism effect, so, so we give that box shadow. Going back again, looks much better. But if the alignment also have that problem, so what we can do is to fix the alignment in Bootstrap. So first, I'm going to give the row a display flex and a margin to bottom five. So this will going to push it down. And uh, for this one, I'm going to make sure it's going to align in the center. And also, don't forget to put that word um, deflex. And for the next one, I want to push it to the end. So I give it a class name, justify content end. So this is a habit. You write all your bootstrap things together without your own class name. If you want to do something on your own for your own page that's going to be customized the class name, you separate it. You do not mix your own class name and also the bootstrap class name, unless have to, okay? And we've done that. 
So we're going back to the browser and we look at that. It looks really, really decent and with all of those buttons spread out. And the last bit is to find how many items in our cart, in our bag, and what's the total price to pay. How do we count that? Very easy way. We get the data from the, uh, the bag array, which is the game array. As long as we know the length of that array, we can know the total item number, right? So it's very handy to put in the JavaScript code there to say game.length. And here you have the three. And you know that you have three items in your um, shopping bag. This part, the total, um, takes quite a bit of skills. We have to do the calculation uh, to find out the total value of your bag item and then put that value here. So what I will do, I will write a function over here. And we're going to set it using some local state variable. We'll say const total and set total equals to use state. So how much you're going to pay initially, you have to put in the initial states. Initially, you're going to pay nothing, right? We'll assume that the customer haven't added anything to our shopping bag. So initially, going to be $0. And then after that, we write a function whose name is a handle total payment. That's going to be an error function. And then inside, we just do the calculation. Um, how do we calculate that? This is going to be using a chain of a lot of JavaScript, the higher order array function I'll show you right now. Very, very cool way of writing functions. First, we're going to map through our game um, because inside the game, we have different objects, which is all these game objects. And then we're going to find out all of those data that we need to find out the, the total payment, which is the discount and price. We're going to use these two to calculate how much we're going to pay after discount for each item being added to our shopping bag. Right? So we're going to do a map. So inside the map, we want to each game to return one thing, which is the price after discount. We want each game to return one thing, which is the price after discount. How we do that? For each game, we do game.price, just our typical calculation, times one minus discount, right? Game dot discount. So as soon as we do that, this thing, after mapping, will return us with an array. This array will only contain numbers, which is the number of the, the, the price after discount. Right? So that's what the mapping for. And after that, we're going to chain in another higher order array function called reduce. Reduce is very useful to do accumulation and calculation, especially for our scenario. If you have an array that contains digital numbers only, say for example, an array contains 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you want to know what's the, the sum of total, you can use the use reduce um, function to have it done immediately. And the way to do so is that it will take in a built-in variable called accumulator. And also it will take in the current value. And those things are going to be the mapped into the error function. We want to make sure our accumulator is keep accumulating based on the current value. OK? And the last bit of the function, you must tell the, this uh, function what's the initial value. The initial value is 0 because we're adding from the 0. So what it means is that, say for example, I'm just going to show you the example. If you have an array that says it has a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you want to know the total sum of these, first you're going to tell the reduce function the initial starting point is 0, and you just keep accumulating by adding them all together. So the way it works, it will be 0 plus 1 gets accumulated into accumulator, that will be 1, and the current value is set to 1. And then it moves to the next one, the current value is set to 2, the accumulator is 1, so 1 plus 2 equals to 3. So this one goes to 3, and then you reset the current value to 3, which is the next one. 3 plus 3 equals to 6. That's how it works, one by one. It'll go through each individual item and add the previous one all together and store in the accumulator variable until we reach the end. So what we did here is that when we do the mapping first, we're going to obtain the price after discount as an array through this mapping function. So this map will return us something like this, except that the array will contain the price after discount. 
not the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we map, we use the reduce function to accumulate all the price up to discount inside that array and have the total. Okay, this is called the chain of the JavaScript higher order array function. And then we just assign that to a variable or alternatively, if you are cool enough, just return it straight away. That's it, done. You can reassign it to a variable called a total and then return total down the bottom, but why bother? Say one on the code and just return it. So this function will do one job, summarization of every price of the discount. But now we have this done. The next problem is, how do we trigger this function? We don't have any click events. We want that to show immediately on our page, right? We don't have the events. We have to click somewhere to, sh to see the total number. No. How do we do that? If you want something to show immediately on the DOM when the page gets mounted, we're going to have to use something called the use effect hook, which is the magical way of handling that uh, uh, mounting stuff. So when the page gets mounted on the DOM, and the use effect hook will be triggered to call whatever inside it. So that thing takes a arrow function and also an array, which you're going to inject at the dependency. Depending on what, the use effect hook will be called again. So here we're just going to uh, call that function handle total payment. You think that's going to be sufficient? Eventually, that thing will return us with a number with two decimal places, right? And we want that number to be set in our total state variable. So instead, we cut. We say set total to that function. So this will do when when the page gets mounted, it will call that function, get your total number, and set that to the local variable total, and then you map it on uh, you render it on the DOM. This we're gonna inject the dependency games. Why? Because every time the game changes, you want the computer to recalculate the total price. Otherwise it will only be calculated once. Later on the, the customer add more things into the bag. This will not be touched again. It depends on the variable game. As long as the game changes, so long this function will be run again. That's what it is for. And here, down here, we're just going to show very simple total. That's it. Super, super cool, right? So did I miss something? I think I should add one more thing to make it more decent because we're going to chain the to fix function as well to make sure it has a two decimal place only after calculation. So look at that, really fancy function, right? Three lines of code, down here's the job. And we go back to our back. Uh, we're just going to reload the page. The back is currently empty to see if it's working. Add one item, add one item, add one item. And we go to our back and you look at that. The total price automatically changes based on these three payments. These are timed by um, one minus fifty percent. It gives you the price of the discount. So those three price of the discount are automatically added up together and come to this number. Wonderful, super, super awesome. Okay. So this is a, a demonstrate how you're gonna use the higher order array function in a real project, not just a standard tutorial. You learn this tedious function and you never know how to use them, but now you know how to use in a real world scenario. Awesome. Cool. We now have our shopping bags done now as well. Um, what else left? Pretty much it. And the only thing remaining is that uh, uh, header. In our header, we're going to show the, the number in our badge. Without me explaining, just go ahead and think about how we're going to do that. We have done this job already in our previous, just probably 10 minutes ago in the video. We have done this job. You use what to, sh to see how many items in your library, how many items in your bag. We used array length. Right? You're just going to simply call the global variable in the header and calculate the length of the bag array and the length of the library array and present that figure there. Very easy. Let's go get and do that. We close this off. So we're going to our header. <coughs> and it is true that uh, when you use the, uh, um, the use contact hook, you're going to have to import that hook every time you want to use it, but it's already handy enough. Otherwise, you think about, we use this global variable uh, bags and libraries at the super, super parents level. We're going to drill down to each individual layer. That's probably going to be five or four layers down to the end. It will be very, very messy if you do that property drilling without creating that um, super global variable. So we're still going to use the uh, use contact hook. And 
we're going to import that uh, app contacts over here. So those things are done. And the next job is to create, um, is to have our libraries and backs global variable ready, not a variable. library back that one equals to use contacts which is the app contacts done so this global to this two global variable comes in and we just need a length of them to show over here so in the like button we're going to show the library dot length so in that back icon we're just going to show the back dot length. Done. Super easy, right? If you don't have this global thing, here you're going to have to create local variables to write functions to retrieve those things from other components, heaps of property drillings, very, very tedious. And you end up probably going to be with um, a lot of bugs and you just lose confidence. And this is going to be very super handy way uh, if you have the variable share across the entire app. So once we go back and see that number changes to three because we got three items in our back. If we remove, you see that number changes to two immediately. This is instantaneously go back to zero, right? Let's just test out the like button. That one goes to one, two, three. Perfect. Go into library. Those things are there. Remove them. Super awesome. All right, guys, we have pretty much finalized our project. Um, except the mobile responsive view, I'm not going to demonstrate how to do that because it's just simple CSS adjustment. If you like to give a try, you can just do the adjustment on your own. It's not a super complicated. Just adjust the paddings and stuff. Uh, you should achieve it very quickly. And in this project, we have learned so much. So to wrap up, you have learned how to build an animated section and a banner, and also the side menu with the different width toggled on. You have also learned how to build a dynamic carousel with different card information, and also this isolated trailer button looks amazing. So the last part I probably want to do is to turn on the autoplay so it can play itself. And to do so, we're going to the swiper. This few lines that I commented out in the first session is because if it keeps running, I can't um, build it. And we'll just release that, going back to the browser, reload it. And very soon you will see uh, that thing you see that automatically um, runs this on its own. And all of those toggle video things work so fun, so cool. And you're, in this video, you also learned how to build a very beautiful uh, dynamic product card, which contain too much functions. And I probably already overload you, but uh, you just need to go step by step to digest this. We have the like button. We have the add to shopping cart button, shopping back button. We have this dynamic rating stuff showing the star, number of stars based on the rating. This is not hard coded. And also we have this dynamic icon where I can show the item numbers. The section pages pop in, pop back. And on the category page, we have learned how to build an advanced filter function and also the search bar function as well. Heaps of stuff. Pretty much all of the introductory to intermediate um, skill in React, I have passed on so many uh, in this video. I hope you really like it. And uh, if you do feel that my video is helpful, you learn you can learn something from my course. Please subscribe to my channel, and uh, I'll be motivated to do more good quality work uh, in the future to demonstrate um, more advanced stuff or more other stuff in the React.js. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.